Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. Uh, the past few weeks, we've had rain out here in California, and now we're living up to our name, sunny California. So the sun's out. It's going to be a great day. We have a great show ahead. We have a wonderful guest, Steph Vukovic, who is going to be talking about genetics and nutrition. But she also has a very personal story that led her to our organization, our 501c3, The Way to My Heart, and she joined our group, and she has been lending her expertise about nutrition um, to many members of our group with questions, so I thought, you know what, let's invite her to come on and answer all of the questions at once, because she's proven to be very, very popular with all of her information on <laughs> supplements and more, so I'm really excited about the conversation ahead, but hello, John. Hello, Miss Kim. How are you? We don't have a team in the Super Bowl. So what are we going to do? <laughs> I, I have the well, 49ers. Yes, kidding. you do. And I was waiting for you to come back and say, wait a minute. I was just trying to make you feel good. Uh, well, I'm trying to figure out who I'm going to pull for. And there's a lot of women in my household that I suspect they'll be pulling for the Chiefs. I myself and my son will be pulling for the 49ers, I believe. You know, I think Brock Birdie, he has the potential to become the modern day Joe Namath. And I remember, you know, that Super Bowl where I wasn't alive, but I did a little, I was a sports anchor, right? And I just remember that story, you know, that, that you know, here's that guy that, you know, when all odds were against him, he was able to lead his team to victory. And so if Brock Purdy can do that, I will literally tip my hat to him as being the modern day Joe Namath, because I think... Everyone is in favor of of Taylor Swift getting proposed to after the Super Bowl trophy is handed over to Kelsey. <laughs> um, I'm, I have no comment on that, nor does anyone <laughs> care to hear what my comment is, particularly my family members. But a number, a couple of things. I'm really excited to have this conversation with Steph because. Uh, I myself and a, another partner, we're opening up a men's health clinic. It's a franchise that actually started in uh, Carlsbad, California, and uh, we offer um, vitamin injections. So I'm, I want to pick her brain about some of the things we offer and, and see if it makes sense. But before we do that, so Kim, do you think you could kind of reach back into the recesses of your mind, put your reporter hat on and just... What give me one question that you would ask either Super Bowl coach, so Andy Reid or um, what's the other guy's name? I'm blanking. Anyway, like be before they're going to halftime, like what what would you ask Andy Reid? Like it's halftime. Let's say they're up ten to seven. What are you going to ask him? You know, you're pulling him off. He, he wants to get into the locker room. You got one question. What are you going to so ask? Is he him? ahead? And I would ask him. He's ahead. How do you He's ahead. The momentum. I mean, how do you keep the momentum going? And that's always the big question because there's it's such a mental game at that point, right? Whether they're winning, they're losing. But if they're winning, they've got to keep that momentum going because they have to be prepared for a big strategy shift, you know, from the other team. And so obviously, in order to maintain that that lead, they've they've got to keep that momentum. So what is their strategy, you know, going into the second half? I mean, that's honestly, you know, what I would that's, ask. You know, you, you, I close my eyes. I could be there now. Kyle Shanahan, who I think is the coach of the 49ers, let's say he's down seven points going into oh, half. Wow. What are you going to tell him or ask him, I should say? I mean, it's such an easy thing. You you honestly just want to know how they're going. To, I, you know, personally, I would want to know what went wrong because they all sit there for hours and hours and hours and watch, you know, the the game footage over and over and over again. And they they like what surprised them in the first half from the other team because they had to have been, if they were prepared, they watched the, the, the footage from before they had to have known the team strategy. I mean, you would think that they would. So what mm -hmm. surprised them about the team strategy that left them, you know, falling short. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> <Good> um, <job. laughs> but I do have a little Super Bowl um, tie in to mm -hmm. peripheral artery disease. We talk a lot about peripheral artery disease, poor circulation and mainly the legs. And I did a little research because I, I love just data. Did you know that if every 20 seconds someone loses a limb somewhere in the world due to a diabetic ulcer, as you know, many of those diabetic ulcers stem from not only too much sugar, right? In the blood, but also along with that is poor circulation. So how many based on every 20 seconds 
around the world, someone is losing a limb due to a diabetic ulcer. How many do you think are losing a limb during the four hours of the Super Bowl? 720 people stand to lose their limbs during the four hours that we are sitting there watching the Super Bowl. And that's yeah. really sad. Uh, that is when you put it into perspective. Sobering thought. Yep. Sorry, yep. I'm raining on everyone's parade. I'm like the Debbie Downer. Go enjoy uh, the Super Bowl now. Yes, but you know what? I, we can. We're going to have a great conversation, and I think at the end of the day, we're going to learn something about. Uh, it is Heart Month, right? February's Heart Month. I just read too that Carl Weathers, who I loved in Happy Gilmore and Rocky, he died from um, probably an MI, but they're they're calling it atherosclerotic uh, coronary artery disease. So oh, he probably wow. had an MI. So again, the. We can talk about diet because I think there's a lot of ways uh, that people can change their diet and and reduce their risk of cardiovascular events and peripheral uh, arterial disease and supplements yeah. as well. So it's going to be, I, I think, hopefully very educational, not only for us, but for our, our listeners. And I think it's, it could have a, a great impact. Nutrition is such a great component, as we mentioned, when it comes to diabetes, then ultimately that poor circulation. And so there is so much power that every single human being has in being able to, to, you know, have the, their fate kind of in their own hands. There, there's something that they Ooh. potentially could do um, when it comes to diet and nutrition in many parts of the world. Now, granted, we do have to take into consideration as we go forward in this conversation that there are a lot of people that may not have as much of a choice because there are still so many people in poverty and the socioeconomics play such a, a great role in terms of cardiovascular and vascular diseases. And that's something that we all need to come together as a community and communities around the world to help make sure that the haves are able to help the have nots rise up and be able to get the proper nutrition that they need, which should be, you know, a, a right for everybody to have that nutrition. 100%. You have to have faith, which is probably a pretty good segue into my quote, quote for the day. Yes. Dr. John Phillips, spectacular vascular moment of inspiration. So I know we only have about a minute left, but the, the book that I'm reading right now is called Think and Grow Rich. And it's not necessarily about trying to make money, but it's getting yourself in the right mindset to, to succeed at something that you really want to succeed at. And part of it is, is having faith in what you can do. And they use a term called auto-suggestion, where if you think about something long enough, it can actually turn into a physical kind of uh, attribute or actually have a physical um, part in the universe. It's it's actually really fascinating. The, the book was written back in the 1930s. Yeah, manifesting. It's awesome. But so there's a, there's a chapter on faith, and the author is Napoleon Hill, so I'm quoting him. And he says... Faith is the eternal elixir which gives life, power, and action to the impulse of thought. So you have a thought, you have faith in that, and then you can actualize it. So let's do it today. I love it. I love it. Well, I have faith. This is going to be a great show. We have Steph Fukovic. She is going to be here in just a few moments. We're going to head to break, and we will be right back with an amazing conversation about genetics and nutrition. So stay with us. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. We have a special guest today. We have Steph Fukovic. She is a specialist in genetics and nutrition and the intersection of that. And we are going to get to her in just a moment. But I do want to offer a very important reminder that you really need to make sure not to act on any information provided during this show by Steph, by John, by myself, by anyone without explicit consent from your own healthcare team. We don't have access to your medical history. We don't know your comorbidities. We don't know your current medical situation and how your body may react to supplements or foods or medicines or anything else. So please, Make sure you do have explicit consent from your own healthcare team before acting on any information provided here. That being said, I want to welcome Steph to the show, and I want to share how she came into my life, which was through our group for peripheral artery disease, which is that poor circulation and mainly the legs. Uh, she thought she had it. She came into our group, and even though she doesn't have it, she never left. And I'm so excited because now we have her as our expert in genetics and nutrition in the intersection of. So, Steph, thank you so much for joining us. We can't hear you. 
So basically, I know that she has something that's with her veins. I'm hoping that maybe we can get her. She, we might have to deal with a little bit of it. Now we can hear you. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much. Yeah. So welcome, you had a welcome, little Stephanie. bit of a personal story that that led you to us. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I come from a history with, you know, um, my, uh, family going back a lot of cardiovascular disease, um, uh, varicose veins, you know, um, a lot of cardiovascular issues. So when my legs started pooling after my pregnancy, it was like, it happened right at the end of my pregnancy. It was, it kind of was like, I was nine months pregnant and the pregnancy it never ended after I had my son. Um, I had claudication in my legs, which is like a swelling, um, breathlessness, fatigue, uh, constant pelvic pain. Um, this one was really interesting. Um, as I was chasing these symptoms, I ended up at an endocrinologist. Um, mm -hmm. I told him, I said, you know, could this be some type of like endocrine hypertension? Um, because I, I developed spontaneous high blood pressure that I'd never had before. Um, he tested my aldosterone and renin levels. Both were, what are those? Very, I'm sorry. What are those? Um, aldosterone and renin levels are, um, hormones from the adrenals in the kidney that, um, basically kind of talk to each other and they're the ones that control, uh, blood pressure. Okay. Um, so when you have only one that's high, so let's say you only have high aldosterone and low renin, or it may now it may be the other way around, but when only one is high, um, that's indicative of like, um, adrenal fatigue or like, uh, like, um, Addison's where it's like, um, kind of a, a cortisol crisis. Um, but when both are elevated aldosterone and renin levels, um, that's indicative of kidney stricture. So, then they're telling me, well, we think that you might have like, you know, some type of stricture in your kidney. I went for an MRA, um, an MR angiogram of my kidney. They didn't see anything. So I'm like, okay, well, what now? Um, I went down the gamut. It was a urologist, gynecologist. I saw a psychiatrist at one point. Um, my doctors were just like, maybe this is anxiety. Maybe this is postpartum. Um, the only thing that panned out of that is that, you know, we, all we did was talk about my pain. <laughs> um, endocrinologist, nephrologist. Um, the doctor who did help me where we finally broke ground was uh, the interventional radiologist. Mm -hmm. They um, they ended up running um, what was an MRV. That's an MRI venogram, which is just imaging of my pelvis. And it looks at my veins and I, I don't think it looks at arteries. I think that's the angiogram, but I could be mistaken. At any rate, when they did, they were, um, they identified several compressions, which was kind of unfortunate because they'd never been seen for the last three and a half years until just now. So it's been a long time coming. Um, and I asked my doctor why no one had caught it for the last three and a half years. He said that it's something that really need, you know, uh, these radiologists, interventional radiologists need to be trained to look for, or they'll miss it. Absolutely. Um, so my compressions so far <laughs> are, um, May Thurner syndrome, which is an iliac vein compression. Um, the iliac vein is the one that kind of processes the blood between your legs and back up to your heart. Um, mine's squished. Um, the other one that I have that's a little more rare is called posterior nutcracker syndrome. Um, that's where the renal vein is compressed between the aorta and the spine. Um, because it is where it is against the spine, um, stenting is not an option. Um, so, so I said, well, what is the best option? I was given two options. One was for um, a left renal vein. It was an LRVT, left renal vein, um, uh, where they, they move, they transplant the vein um, to your kidney, a fresh vein. Um, I heard that has a very low success rate. The other one was um, uh, renal autotransplantation, where they actually, they take my left kidney and they transplant it to my right side. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So to go from no answers to now we're talking 
I'm going to be meeting with a, a vascular surgeon and a transplant surgeon um, in the next two weeks is crazy. <laughs> So, um, so yeah. And, and so what, what they're going to do now is that they identify those in imaging. What they do is they, they do a venogram with IVUS, um, intravascular. Ibis, yeah. Right. What's that? It's a, it's a, it's a camera that goes in and it uses audio waves, I believe. And yes. then it, um, is able to really get a good 3d picture of what's going on inside the veins. Yes, exactly. And, and right now, I, I guess that's, you know, that's the gold standard for treatment and um, even placing stents so that they're, you know, they know where to place them properly, the size, all of that. Um, I was recommended to never get a venogram or like stenting placed without the IVUS. So that's something I really looked for. Um, so that's my next step. I'm um, next week, actually, I'll be in downstate Michigan and I will receive the, the venogram with IVUS. They will determine the compressions in entirety and then make a plan from there. Um, but uh, they're going to also be looking at um, my inferior vena cava. That's another one that may be compressed. Right. Um, oh, really? That's a bad one to be compressed. So, so this is going to get really interesting for you guys. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but so, um, I searched high and low for the interventional radiologists that I have now. Um, they, they are not all built the same. Yeah. And, um, I, I was in another support group that I have and he was, he was really highly touted. So anyway, as he was, he was the one who identified all the compressions. Um, we talked and I said, you know, how is this even possible? It must've been the pregnancy. Um, I had my son in September of 2020 and he said, th this was surprising. He said that he, when he sees multiple compressions, that's, that typically goes hand in hand with, um, Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Uh, there's 13 forms of Ehlers Danlos, and one of them is called VEDS, uh, vascular Ehlers Danlos. Um, so now I'm I'm going down that <laughs> that whole gamut of I don't even know what that is. I'd never heard of it. John, yeah. Have you? Yeah, yeah. It's a um, it's a form of typically in the arteries where there's issues within the arterial walls that can lead to aneurysms and um, sections and things like that yeah. folks have very specific phenotype for it though and coming up right here on the heart of innovation we are going to uh talk more with steph about her story and also get into the intersection between genetics and nutrition so stay with us thanks for joining us today everybody we are continuing our conversation with steph vukovic micronutrient expert and health coach who in the previous segment was telling us about some of the, the venous congestion and constriction issues that she's been dealing with that sounds like have been leading to some lower extremity swelling. And ultimately, you've got in touch with somebody who is going to do a little bit more investigation or work and uh, some imaging to see if if you might need intervention. So that's I'm glad you, you finally, you know, you're in the rabbit hole, but it looks like you're not digging any farther down, right? Right. It's uh, yeah, it's it's good to finally have answers, even though they're not great. You know, it, it's it definitely affirms um, what I was feeling and what I've been going through. Um, I think that was the hardest was not having answers. Um, but what was interesting um, that I, for, I didn't get to mention with the renal um, with the renal autotransplantation is not just my renal vein, but my renal artery is also squished for whatever reason. So, yeah, very, huh. very strange. That's, that's, yeah. that's a new one. I'd, lo I'd love to, mm -hmm. on a, you know, not a voyeuristic request, but I'd, it'd be interesting to see your images. I'm, I'm curious about that one. Yeah. Um, but so, so tell us a little bit about what you do as a micronutrient expert and health coach and, and how that kind of got you thinking about, you know, what's going on with your body. Ah, good question. So, okay. So, and I'm going to read this because I, I, I am a little shy, so a little nervous. So, so my job as a nutrigenomics coach and counselor is to interpret genetic material, um, typically raw data, identify variants in the data, and teach clients how best to support those variants so they should work as they should. Um, examples would be like MTHFR, um, MTHR, yeah, they... MTHR. The MTHFR is, is basically if you have this gene, 
your body struggles with turning food into fuel. And so you're, I believe your, your B vitamins aren't absorbing. You're not turning that folic acid. You know, a lot of our breads and, and things are enriched pastas. They're enriched with folic acid, but you can't, your body can't turn that folic acid into folate. So is mm. it, it, so you end up with an enzyme that doesn't get broken down in this process, this digestion process, and it's called homocysteine. And when there's too much homocysteine, it's only, almost like nails is what my dad. So I have it. My dad has it. And I think my older brother has it. And they, they describe it as being like nails on your artery walls. And when you have damage in the artery walls, that's where those, those small LDL particles can get in there and start building up and pushing that wall up and creating restriction in your, in your blood flow. And John, you're always welcome to correct me if I'm wrong. That's just the way the dietitian described it to me for us. You know, I, I I don't claim to know much about diet and the the way things are broken down. Other than that, you know, a good Mediterranean diet is something that we we preach in, mm -hmm. in caloric restriction. Um, but yeah, I think I think uh, what what's interesting to me, Steph, is the fact that you're taking what sounds like pretty complex information yeah. and 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 translating it in, into like a sixth grade level. I would imagine for patients. What <laughs> what what is your educational background, if I may ask? So I'm an LLNC right now, um, a limited liability um, nutrigenomics coach. Um, I it started out just as as a patient, like anybody else, looking for answers. Nutrigenomics is relatively new; it's about the last ten years or so, say 10, 12 years. Um, and at the time, you know, with with genetic testing, you know, you get the results, and it's like, okay, you can either take them, you can panic about it, or you, you know, I said I wanted to learn how to best support them, like how can we how can we change this so that they can work as they should. Um, I started in groups, um, working with people. Um, eventually I, it's really just, it's, it's blown up. Um, I work one of my, she's my mentor colleague, one of my good friends. Um, her name's Bailey Farstead. She's, um, she's the creator of Norns. Um, she has a master's in nutrigenomics and biophysics. Um, she's also the, uh, um, she's, uh, let me see here. I had her, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. Um, That's okay. We're, she's we're, also we're on the radio. Nervous. That's all. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Um, but um, she's also the head of the fibromyalgia research board over in Oslo. Although she is American descent, so um, but so I work with her. Um, as I was working with her, I started to work with um a lot of other um physicians um and and you know um counselors. Um, another thing is nutrigenomics spills over into estrogen metabolism perimenopause, menopause, um, COMPT, uh, the catechol-O-methyltransferase gene, um, is responsible for estrogen metabolism, estrogen catechols, um, methyls, methyl donors. Uh, I, there's a huge list. I would have to read it. But um, so at any rate, I really, I delve deep. Um, after a while, I've become um, kind of a, a a staple for people uh, like, you know, to direct them for sources. I, I help um, interpret genetic panels. I help, um, you know, direct people to sources as needed. Um, right. So basically so when they have these genetic snippets that uh, may not be normal, you're able to say, okay, well, here's some action that you can take. Here's some resources that you can use to help make a difference. Because a lot of people that end up coming to you, like, you know, in our case with my dad and the MTHFR that we were really trying to get to the bottom of what are all the factors that are damaging his arteries leading to that plaque buildup. And most mm -hmm. general mainstream, you know, facilities don't um, deal with that. They say, you have heart disease. These are your options. Here are the pills. Here are your statins. Here are your blood thinners, your anticoagulants. And oh, if you need an intervention, we'll do that. If you need a bypass, we'll do that. But for me, uh, you know, a lot of people want to step back and go, okay, what has led to this? And there isn't as much, you know, research, you know, into, you know, a lot of that. And so there are some natural means and that's what we were, I was trying to figure out how do I empower my dad to, to take action for his health. And the only way to do that was through genetic testing and being able to give him some actionable items where he could, you know, see in his blood work, there were improvements based on his action. And we, we were able to find that. And so are you finding that with a lot of yours? 
just real quick, walk me through that. The like, uh, if a patient came to me and said they want genetic testing, I mean, for me, when we talk about genetic testing, it's actually looking at somebody who may have problems. As curious with- as Dr. John is, we are going to have to go to commercial break here on 860 AM, The Answer. Keep listening on for the heart of innovation with Kim McNichols, Dr. John Phillips, and their guest, Steph Bolkovich. Welcome back, everybody. And before I was so rudely canceled by our producer, I was trying to ask a question for Steph and Kimberly. Colin's got to keep you in line. Um, So uh, uh, explain to me how, if a patient came to me and said, I want some genetic testing for my cardiovascular disease, what am I supposed to say to that person since I don't personally do it and nor do I know much about it? Right. Well, so a lot of times providers will just refer out to a geneticist. I mean, that's the default. You could do that. Um, there are there are options, though. So um, there's commercial testing, which everyone knows that's uh, testing such as 23 and me or um, Ancestry. That's considered exploratory testing. Um, that's a good jumping off point, actually. And I'll, I'll explain in a second. The other one, though, is clinical testing. Now, the difference between them is actually huge. Um, it boils down to cost and the amount of information garnered from the um, from the test results. So um, clinical testing does not offer raw data, um, which is super, I mean, it's so invaluable for further genetic identification. Um, raw data is a compilation of about 600,000 to 700,000 um, genes and variants. Wow. Um, ranging from cardiovascular all the way to pharmacological interactions through the CYP450 um, pathways in the liver. Um, commercial testing all is great not- to me. <laughs> <laughs> so the CYP450 pathways are um, liver pathways that help um, break down medication, hormones, ever- toxins, heavy metals, everything you can think of. Um, so anyway, um, so clinical testing isn't typically covered either. Um, as you had mentioned earlier, sometimes it is, it depends how you do it. Um, so, but if I were to recommend for someone starting out, especially if they're not sure if they really want to go down that route, um, and they're just kind of curious would be to do commercial testing. Um, and like the 23 and me. Correct. 23andMe or Ancestry. Um, You do not need to buy a membership. You do not need to buy the most expensive package to get your raw data. Literally the most basic package, no membership, they will give you your raw data. Um, Right now, the only problem with 23andMe is that they've they've really locked down their raw data feature so that instead of just freely downloading it out of your profile, you have to contact them and have them email it to you. That, that maybe, knowing that that's what you need to do, you just go ahead and do it, right? Right, right. And I now, think that company's going bankrupt, actually. Well, yeah. they just have data leak after data leak after data leak. And then they went and they sold a bunch of people's information to a pharmaceutical company. So I still sure. have my kid here, which I heard would have helped me, you know, in a, in a less expensive fashion to learn about having the MTHFR mutation. And I just left it there and went and paid the full price, you know, at my local you know, just walk in and, and got it done. I think it was like $180. It was very expensive, but um, it, it does get concerning, you know, Steph for, for people, you know, with those facilities. I mean, has Ancestry had the same problems or have they been a little bit? No. So, so as far as 23andMe, what happened was um, at the beginning of the Israeli um, Palestinian war, um, someone did, someone was able to hack into their system. What they did was they threatened to leak Ashkenazi Jew heritage from, um, the 23andMe site. Um, I, 23andMe says that it didn't happen, you know, that, that they, there was a threat, but it never, it never made it that far. Uh, it's hard to say, but what I will say is that, um, Originally, I would have told you, you know, you can do 23andMe anonymously. You can you can go in as J- Jane Doe and get your results, go into your profile and download your raw data. Right now, that's not an option. Um, you actually have to prove you are you to receive your raw data. So I wouldn't advise using an alias if you use 23andMe. But right now, um, 
it's still, it is still an option. Um, 23andMe, it does have um, several genes that are FDA approved. And um, so like the, the panels, so it, it is, it is a good test and it's very um, universal. So there's geno genomic panels online where you would upload this raw data. And when I use the word upload, I'm use that very loosely because you're not actually uploading you're, you're kind of running it through. So it's never saved. It's anonymous. They don't have you sign up for anything. And so Steph, when, let me, let me just, uh, if I can, ex yes, I'm if sorry. You can explain this to me, like I'm a kindergartner, cause I'm, I'm having a little bit difficult time kind of understanding what, so let's say I, I, I pay for the test, right? I get a test okay. from 23 me or whatever. Now I get these results back. Okay. What am I supposed to do with them? Give them, so you're gonna get, talk to you. Okay. So you're going to get, you're going to get the 23 and me results. Those that's okay. where you open up your profile and it just, it looks, you know, it's, it's this whole thing and you're going through and you're going, Oh, I have an iron deficiency in my family or I have this. Okay. So there's that. Then there's raw data. Raw data is just the most basic PDF file of just, I mean, it's RSID numbers, which are um, gene variants, but it's 600,000 to 700,000. So, wow. so, so after my head explodes, then what do I do? <laughs> so you there don't are, look at sites, right? You can go to different sites and there are yes. sites, there's a couple of them that I think that they're even donation based. You go in there and like, for example, with what we did with my dad's MTHFR was they, you don't see straight on the 23 in the results that you have this MTHFR mutation. What you have to do is go and they have some sort of algorithm. Um, you can calculate it yourself. There are formulas online, or you can put it into this one website and say, Hey, you know, take my data do the calculations for me and, and make sense of all of this information. And it crunches all the numbers. And it says, based on what we figured out is you have this MTHFR mutation, for example. And then that's where also I think, Steph, you're able to guide people. You're able to say, hey, I'll take that information. I'll upload it for you. I'll um, help you make sense of all of it. And then I'll give you some sort of practical strategy if there is a practical strategy in terms of nutrition or whatever they're eating or supplements that they can do in order to um, counteract the impact of that uh, genetic mutation, such so, as with MTHFR. Uh, okay. So then let's take, so Steph, let's say I do this and give aside from the MTFHR, whatever that mutation, give me an, another common one that I might have. Um, oh, Oh boy. Okay. So everyone has a comp gene now that, okay. so there's the MTHFR, which she was talking about Okay. now comp is right next there. They're like brother and sister comp is the, um, comp controls. Um, let's see here. It's, uh, the, the, um, catechols, catechol estrogens, heavy metals, um, toxins, uh, methyl, methyl donors, um, metabolism, what that means. So let's is, say I have a, de a defect in that or something, right? Well, so everyone has a status. There's three statuses for okay. um, that, uh, that 158 met, which is there's slow, um, balanced or fast. So that's how these genes express. They don't, it's not like it doesn't work at all. It will either be very slow, intermediate, or it works faster than it should, which means it may potentially clear um, catechols or dopamine, adrenaline, norepinephrine, um, it may clear those very quickly. So anyway, um, yeah. Uh, Let's say I have one that's slow. Mm -hmm. What do you? What? 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 What would you recommend? You know, I guess I'm just trying to walk it through for our yeah. listeners. You know, like what? Yeah, are, how does? How, how do so, we get some value out of this? Yes, that's a that's a great question. So so slow comp. If you have slow comp, which about I would say a third of the population does. I mean, there's only three variants that you can have. Um, and I, I tend to run into people with slow comp quite a bit. In fact, my mother is. Um, that seriously, seriously impacts estrogen metabolism um, because it impacts estrogen metabolism. Um, not only that, but toxins, heavy metals, the catechols, um, that really increases, um, you know, oxidization and the... Um, it, it increases uh, the carcinogens in, in your oh, liver wow. and stuff because you can't detox. Coming up on the Heart of Innovation, we're going to figure out the last bit of information here with our host, Steph Bokovich. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to 860 AM, The Answer. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Welcome back to the show. And we have Steph Vukovic with us. And before the break, 
um, we were allowing her, she has this cough gene that I think it's called. And it's not a matter of if you have some sort of mutation, it's just a matter of which mutation you have. Do you have a slow intermediate or do you have a fast um, gene? And that affects the, um, is this just for women or is this for both men and women in terms of their estrogen absorption um, that ultimately impacts the, the amount? Like you were saying that if they have slow, which a third of people possibly do, that they have more carcinogens and such that are not getting, you know, uh, flushed out of their system. Yes. Yep. It definitely affects men also. And, um, I work with quite a few men. See what the thing about slow comp is, um, it's also called the warrior gene. Um, and, and it's true to its nature because typically when I work with people with slow comp, they're more of a warrior or they, they're more high anxiety. Um, that's also the decreased catechol metabolism where they have higher adrenaline levels, higher, you know, um, so, so yeah, it definitely affects men and women, um, for sure. Um, one of the big things I want to bring up about COMP is that with MTHFR is COMP determines whether you can metabolize methyl vitamins, uh, efficiently or not. Um, people with slow COMP cannot metabolize methyls, catechols, methyl donors, methyl donors, such as like L-theanine or what is that? D. L-theanine, it's an yes. amino acid. Um, okay. Methyl don't, um, yeah. It, so, so anyway. So what but, do people do once they find this out? Is this something that you then say, okay, here are the supplements you need in order to help counteract this, to make sure that you can metabolize the, you, you proper, you make sure you set them up with a system where they can properly have that right combination of supplements to counteract that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. We can, we can look and say, okay, so you have an MTHFR gene. Now a heterozygous status comes with a 30 to 40% decrease. A homozygous status comes with an 80% decrease. So you can look and say, okay, you have an MTHFR gene. Now you probably shouldn't have folic acid. Another one that determines folic acid would be the DHFR gene. Um, and so, um, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so people are not figuring out. So the whole moral of the story, we have only about a minute left, is, yes. is really that if you can't figure out what's going on or you want to get to the heart of what is causing it, there's always some sort of genetic factor that may be causing it. And, you know, to find it out, it might be a matter of how much you can invest into the genetic research and then the genetic analysis and ultimately beyond that, the coaching to make sure that you can create a strategy um, to be able to counteract any of those gene snippets that might be leading to whatever chronic ailment you have. But I know like with some of these, um, you know, genetics, John, the, the, the cool thing is the ones that we found, at least with us, is we have been able to find natural ways with supplements to counteract the impact, such as I mentioned quite a few times, the liposomal, the B vitamin injections, and then the liposomal um, injection, uh, the liposomal B vitamin underneath the tongue. Yeah, again, I think that knowledge is power, but you, you just have to be careful. This is just my own editorial, but you have to be careful. You know, we have the saying garbage in is garbage out. And so I guess if you're getting this type of information, you have to find somebody that can help guide you with, you know, what to exactly. do and, and how not to drive yourself crazy or, um, you know, just kind of, I mentioned the rabbit hole, uh, you know, I think that that's really, really important, but there's value yeah. in, in this information and there's value in changing something that's modifiable in your right. risk profile to lowering the incidence of cardiovascular. So the thing that I was reading, cause I was supposed to do an interview about intermittent fasting. Okay. And what I, so the death rates from cardiovascular disease over the past, you know, many years have gone, it, it, it was going down, but the mortality rates are actually going up in people 35 to 65. And huh. it's because we're eating too much and we're not exercising. And so, you know, the, something simple as changing the way you eat or reducing the amount of calories can make a huge dent in your risk for having a cardiovascular event. 
Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, John was just making some really, really good points, you know, just, <laughs> you know, on the fact that um, you can either garbage in garbage out, you know, you, you gotta, it's, you know, especially with these genetic snippets, um, you really do need to make sure that you're being more conscious about, and that's probably one of the benefits of doing it is that you are more conscious about what you're um, putting in and that you in more of the right stuff versus the wrong stuff. Because even for me with a few other genetic things that I discovered about myself, I can't have zucchini and mushrooms and avocados and a few other things that just don't react well with my body, which is mm -hmm. very interesting. And I know that it, it's hard because thank goodness I was able to, um, I actually was able to get that testing covered um, through my insurance or else I wouldn't have been able to afford it. But not everybody has access to that kind of testing. But I want to get to, um, you know, uh, I know, John, you had a, a few questions before we get to some of the other ones in regards to your, which I kind of want to hear a little bit about, is your new um, men's health um, business that is offering these injections and how you determine um, which injections people are getting. And, you know, do you work with coaches or other doctors to um, see, or do you do blood work ahead of time to determine what these people need? Well, I mean, I think that's what I'm trying, trying to figure out because there was a comment in during the show of, I mean, there's supplements everywhere. Um, TV, Instagram, you know, you're just constantly getting bombarded by ads for things. And patients ask me all the time. And frankly, I always tell them, you know, probably these aren't going to hurt you. I mean, if you took a vitamin or if you like coenzyme Q, for example, is, a, is something that we'll recommend in patients who are on statins to help with the metabolism of it and some of the side effects. But, you know, other than that, I don't really recommend much. And so, you know, we offer vitamin uh, B12 injections and, um, um, like a triamino acid kind of a complex. And, and I, again, I, I, I just want to make sure I'm doing what's right for the, 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 the individual and not just trying to peddle some injections that aren't gonna, aren't gonna be a benefit for them. And so the B12, I think is, is pretty well recognized as, as uh, something of value. Um, but you know, some of these other things I'm not hundred percent sure on, and I'm still trying to, trying to learn about them. Yeah, Steph, do you have any guidance on any of that? So typically I would warrant against using high dose B vitamins of just one kind, like B12 or just B, just folate, high dose folate. But I have seen a lot of high, do um, high dose uh, B12 injections help people, especially with pernicious anemia um, or people with MTR mutations who have issues with B12 and methionine. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, um, uh, I think the biggest, the biggest thing that's important is with the B vitamins, especially with methylation is B vitamins are super synergistic. So you can't just take one. You can't. So B6 needs B2. But, you know, B9 and B12 need B6 and B2. They all need each other and they're all supported by magnesium. So I would say if you're doing mega doses of B12, you definitely want to have appropriate cofactors with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We'll have to, we'll have to talk offline. <laughs> yeah. And how to do that with those injections. Cause yeah. I didn't even yeah. know that either. I was, I was just doing the B12 oh. injections. So if you, if like, so if you don't complete the methylation cycle and you're only taking, like, let's say you're, you're doing just a folate supplement, um, that unmetabolized folate, um, accumulates at a homocysteine and it becomes harmful in your system because it can't mm -hmm. be broken down the same with. So when I was diagnosed with MTHFR, I kept continuously having normal B12 serum levels. They were always normal. And everyone would say, you mm -hmm. don't have any B12 issues. And then they ended up doing an, an, M an MMA test, which is the methylmalonic acid test, which checks how much B12 is actually being utilized by your cells in your liver. So the active form, um, I was so deficient. Um, serum testing wow. does a disservice to people because um, it, it's just, it can, it's very erroneous. It can show, it can reflect one thing, but that's not really happening on the cellular, cellular level. Does that make sense? It's interesting because, um, I don't know if you can still hear me. 
it's interesting mm -hmm. um, they, that you say that, that, you know, the, the basic testing that we get done in the general lab, such as just the B12, they think, oh, okay, you're fine. You have no nothing wrong with your B vitamins, but no one thinks to to go further than that. And I find the same, and I'm curious on Dr. You know Phillips, um, in his view as well. But I hear so many, so many times in our groups, oh, I'm fine because my cholesterol, my cholesterol is fine. I used to think the same thing a a until my dad's GP said to him. I'm not testing you for heart disease because your cholesterol is fine and you can't be at risk. There's nothing harmful going on in your body. And it wasn't until we got an advanced lipid panel where they not just tested the quantity, but they tested the quality and they described it to me. The dietitian described it to me, described to me in this way where you could have a whole bunch of large fluffy ones and you could have high levels of those and never be at risk of heart disease. But if you have a lot of these small, dense LDL particles that when they become oxidized by trans fats and free radicals, they tend to be little troublemakers and they can infiltrate the damage in your arteries and then push that, you know, push that wall out and build up calcium inside there. And I, I have to keep repeating this in, in the group, but, you know, that just because your basic lipid panel says you're fine does not make you fine because it's not just about the quantity. It's about the quality. And you do need a lot of HDLs to carry those 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 LDLs and excrete them out of your system. So if your HDLs are low, well, then you're going to also, you're going to have this misbalance. You're going to have more LDLs in there that are getting into trouble. Yeah. So but I, I, but, but I'll just say okay. um, fantastic point. Um, and I got to run after this because my son needs to get picked up. But um, I send probably all my patients to a lipidologist because mm. I don't have the, Good for um, you. I don't have the, frankly, I don't have the time to go through their cholesterol in an appropriate manner that, that is beneficial to the patient. For me, you know, as cardiovascular, as a cardiologist, we, um, you know, we're seeing patients, we're looking at their LDLs. We want them as low as possible. Um, in fact, dogs, don't have LDL, measurable LDLs, and they don't get heart disease. Um, there's actually certain, um, there's an indigenous group of folk, they're almost of like Eskimo um, ethnicity that have like no LDL and they don't get heart disease. But what's worse is you may have a decent LDL, but a low HDL. The HDL is something that you can't really, we can't fix, we can't make more of them yet. And that puts you at a higher risk um, of heart disease than somebody who has a high LDL and a high HDL. Yeah. So I, uh, bottom line is, you know, you get your cholesterol checked um, and then, you know, you can ask for the the, the, the nuclear kind of evaluation. Nuclear resonance, and, NMR. Resonance, yeah. The NMR, they'll get that all, all that stuff for you um, and then go talk to a lipid special. I, I, and I'm not doing the patient any, I'm not helping my patient by being like, oh yeah, here's uh, 40 a Lipitor and see you later. It's like, hey, let's understand this and then let's oh, let's figure out it. ways to, to get it going. So anyway, thanks guys. Have a great weekend. Thank That's you. That's fantastic. Even more reason to love Dr. John. <laughs> I love Seriously, it. Seriously. Yeah. I am so proud to call him a co-host. Stephanie, I'm gonna I'm gonna let the um everyone else take the floor here. You had some very they, we had questions coming in about H um pylori. We had questions coming in about calcium and D vitamins. And um I know that Douglas is has so many questions about just general supplements. And I have a feeling what you're gonna say, you know, the the generalized supplements, the balance of nature says it covers everything you need. Maybe you can talk <laughs> a little bit about how these supplements are absorbed and especially. I was told, for example, Centrum, that um, there was a study that was done and that's not even being, at least the previous one was never even being absorbed in the body, that plumbers were actually finding tons of these not even broken down in the sewage systems, that they have to clean those out, all of these, these supplements out because they're not even absorbing in their body, they're going right through. So it'd be interesting if you can address some of these generalized supplements as well. But um, I'll let you, you start in and, and get that conversation kicked off. Yeah, so um, I uh, I did take the list uh, that you gave me and I kind of broke it down. I gave my opinions of everything, kind of a rundown of what I did know about it. 
Again, if it doesn't correlate with nutrigenomics on some level, I may not be familiar with it because I'm not a full nutritionist. I, I deal with the genetic part of it. But um, being a patient um, and, and also dealing with the cardiovascular aspect of genetics, I am familiar with some supplements. Um, so the first one is CoQ10, which I know we've talked about. Um, the most bioavailable form of CoQ10 to take is ubiquinol. Um, that would be preferred over ubiquinone, which is ac oxidized. Um, ubiquinol dosing typically is like 100 to 300 milligrams a day. Um, but I would, I would recommend ubiquinol over CoQ10 any day, um, especially if you're having absorption problems. Um, let's see here. Um, natokinase. So that'll tie in with K2, which we discussed, um, in group before, but, um, so, so natokinase is an enzyme that's, um, harnessed from the Japanese dish nato, um, fermented soybeans or chickpeas, um, with Bacillus subtilis varnato, um, which is a bacteria, uh, vitamin K2 is derived from natto, um, but natokinase is, because natokinase has been um, isolated from natto, there is no K2 in natokinase. They're separate. So natokinase and K2, MK7 have, or just the K2s in general, have separate but complementary properties. Um, so K natokinase's primary role is blood flow um, by breaking down what's called fibrin, a protein that's involved in the clot formation in the vessels. Um, K2's primary role is regulating calcium metabolism by some more, um, supporting the formation of uh, osteocalcin and facilitating the removal of calcium from vessels and arteries to the bones. Um, that one is so huge um, for cardiovascular health. Um, K2. I, I can't stress it enough, um, which leads me on to the K, the K forms. So when you hear vitamin K, you think coagulation, blood clotting. In fact, a, a interesting um, thing is that uh, vitamin K is actually um, named after coagulation, the German, <laughs> the German name for coagulation. So, so you would think that's what it does. But um, there, there's different forms. There's three forms of vitamin K, just like there's different forms of vitamin B, and they all have different properties, but they all work towards the same goal. Uh, vitamin K has three forms, only two that are read readily available to humans for consumption. Um, vitamin K3 is actually only found in like animal food products. Um, it's found to have toxic effects on like oxygen, carrying red blood cells, uh, it causes liver damage. So you won't hear of vitamin K3. You can't even find it. Um, so vitamin K1 primarily comes from dark leafy greens, such as like spinach or kale. Mm -hmm. That is the vitamin that promotes, um, healthy blood clotting, um, dosing for vitamin K1 is typically 100 to 150 micrograms daily. Now, I don't know how that fits into the window of like peripheral artery disease. Um, but moving on, as far as atherosclerosis goes, vitamin K2 um, is the preferred route. So right, and you take that K2 in, in conjunction with like a D3, like for me, and then uh, I'm curious, just the K2 and the MK7, I don't understand why I'm doing both of them, but thanks to you, actually, I had a nurse practitioner and that I see over here in Marin that told me that I needed to stop the K2 after I had a reaction to the, um, to the COVID vaccine. And she said, no, I'm really concerned about you. You're at a high risk of clotting. So you need to not take the K2 MK7 and then talking to you and talking to also my, my brother, who's very well researched. Um, they were like, no, 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 no. With the atherosclerosis that is genetic to you, like you need to make sure that you're taking that because I also have a vitamin D deficiency. So I, he was like, it's just not going to absorb properly in your body and you're just going to get more calcium is what, you know, I was told. So now I'm back to taking D3, K2, MK7, all in one tablet. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah, great. Yeah. So, so there's, um, there are like 
12 different kinds, 12 to 14 different kinds of menaquinone. So MK7 stands for menaquinone 7. Menaquinones are like a branch amino acid of, uh, let's see here. Um, it, it, I have to kind of look over my notes sometimes too. Um, yeah, so um, there, it's it's menaquinones are a group of molecules that are identified based on length of side chains, and they range from MK2 to MK14. But the 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 two most recognized forms of MK are MK4 and MK7. So I, I run into a lot of people who say, well, MK4 is better. So you will find MK4 is very bioavailable. But the problem is it has such a short lifespan. It goes right through you. Um, it metabolizes mm. in four to six hours. So how much is that really going to help you throughout the day, especially with calcium accumulation? So um, if, if utilizing MK4, you want to use it several times a day. Um, typically, the dosing for MK4 is 15 milligrams three times a day for a total of 45 milligrams. The reason I bring this up is some people can't take K2 MK7, um, whether they have histamine issues um, because fermented foods increase histamine production. Um, MK7 is is derived from from fermented foods such as natto or sauerkraut. So um, people who can't take MK7 can take MK4, but they just have to dose it differently and more often. So so that is something worth noting. Um, but um, one one rule of thumb for, and this is for only MK7 only, is 45 micrograms for every 1,000 IUs of D3. So if you're taking 10,000 IUs of D3, you need roughly 400 to 450 micrograms of MK7. So it's always better. It's usually... I find it's better just to get the ones that are all in one because then it's already measured out for the most part. <laughs> you would think so. I'm a little so, lazy. Uh, I can't do math. Think, yeah. So you would think so. But um, I have found that, you know, it's not, I don't want to call multivitamins or, or compound vitamins snake oil, but boy, do they not do their research when they compound these. I mean, mm. I was just talking with my friend the other day um, about, for example, like, P5P, which is the um, active form of B6, you'll s they sell that as 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams. It'll be in supplements at 25 milligrams. That I, That is so toxic. People are just begging for trouble at those doses. Or on the flip side with D and K supplements mixed, you'll see uh, the, K, the K2 level is way too low for your needs. And which I don't want to just assume, but you may want to check um, your supplement because typically they'll do something like they'll go 5,000 IUs of D3 and then it'll be 100 micrograms of K2, which is nothing. You know, it's a drop in the bucket. So sometimes, so since I've started to kind of go down this journey, I, I definitely um, supplement everything <laughs> separately, which, which um, you know, it's expensive to start up, but they, you don't have to refill everything every month. Sometimes they're 90, 90 days, you know, <laughs> it's just. <laughs> it, it, Kim is uh, wondering, is it safe to take vitamin K with a blood thinner? What if you're on anticoagulants and blood thinners? And yeah. this is, I just want to take a moment to remind everybody that these are things that you do need to have a conversation with your own doctor and, and before acting on any information that you're getting during this broadcast, because we don't know your particular situation. And it, it's not just about, okay, will it interact with your particular blood thinner? But there are so many different combinations of blood thinners, the antiplatelets, the anticoagulants, then on top of that, other medications, um, blood pressure medications. There's also um, statins, you know, there are a lot of combinations. And so it's really important. What I always suggest is to make sure not just your doctor, because your doctor may not know your cardiologist may not know your vascular surgeon may not know the answer to the potential, um, ones, a great person to ask is your pharmacist. And then also ask for a referral to not just a nutritionist, but to a dietitian. And there are even dietitians that have PhDs that are even better that can really dig into the deep end with you on the potential interactions um, or contraindications for any of the supplements, you know, with your current 
uh, medications that you're taking. So it's it's really important because then you can dive into your own medical history. They have the charts in front of them and they can probably give you a more customized answer. We can only talk right now just in in general generalities. So just take what we're saying, you know, with a little bit of a grain of salt and make sure you do write some of this down and we can even help you with some critical questions to ask your doctor to determine if this is um, some of this information is right for you. That being said, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. No, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's a great point. So I, yeah, when, when approaching any of the information that I'm, I'm giving you guys, um, I definitely, I'm just speaking off the cuff. This is not, um, this is not necessarily for people who are on serious blood thinners. You know, I, I would definitely double check with your doctor before um, taking any of these routines, these regimens on, but, um, but they are tips, you know, for, for the general person um, as far as lowering cholesterol, lowering cardiovascular inflammation, um, you know, uh, glucose regulatory action, that kind of thing. So um, moving on, I, another one that I do have on my radar is Reservatrol. I'm not sure if anyone's uh, familiar with that. Um, yeah, it's that's wine. I'll drink more wine. Yeah. 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 It's not just, it's a polyphenol compound, not just found in grapes and berries, but also peanuts, which is interesting. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's known for its cardiovascular protective effects, glucose, lipid regulatory action, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer compound abilities. Um, it's also been considered a potential treatment for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but that's just something that popped up on my radar. It, there's not a lot of science behind it yet. They have more research to do. Um, so the bioavailable and preferred form of Reservatrol is actually trans-Reservatrol. Uh, Reservatrol does lower total cholesterol and LDL while increasing HDL, um, reducing factors for plaque rupture and preventing blood clotting. Um, so Reservatrol is considered an estrogen receptor mediated transcription agonist. Uh, this means that by binding to the estrogen receptor, it has the ability to either act as an agonist or an antagonist, um, mm -hmm. like phytoestrogens do. So I always, I always look into that um, because I deal with estrogen metabolism, but also it's important for people who have estrogen dominance or um, estrogen positive malignancy um, and want to avoid the excess estrogens. Um, dosing for Reservatrol or Trans-Reservatrol is typically 500 milligrams to one gram, depending on the needs, but very important. Um, those with hypothyroidism and hypothyroid conditions should refrain from Reservatrol. Um, it has an affinity for acting as a thyroid disruptor. It, it decreases the expression of thyroid specific genes. So that's not a great option for <laughs> For people with thyroid issues. Um, moving on, another another one that's a favorite of mine, this is actually, this is a big favorite, is pantothene. So pantothene is the bioavailable version of uh, pantothenic acid, which is vitamin B5. So as I said, bees have all different functions. B5 is not part of, it's not involved in methylation. So that's not part of the MTHFR equation or anything. What vitamin B5 is a part of is, um, it's, a, it contributes to adrenal health. Um, so pantothenic acid contributes to the adrenal health, but it does not contribute to cholesterol metabolism. Pantothene does though. Pantothene is typically, um, added to like, uh, plant sterile supplements such as Cholestoff. I believe Cholestoff Complete has it. Um, they label it as the patented, uh, pa I'm sorry, patented version called Pantacin. Um, So at any rate, the whole spiel with that is pantothene is, is wonderful. It can lower cholesterol by 20 to 40%. Um, you can look at, uh, you know, um, reviews about it. People just rave that they've taken half the dose they should and it's dropped their cholesterol. So that's something that um, I'm actually using myself and I hope to, to, recheck my cholesterol in a couple months and see, um, improvement. Um, but 
before I move on, um, like I said, pantothenic acid does not act the same way. That is for adrenal fatigue, but it does not lower cholesterol. So um, going through the list, I see olive oil. I don't have a lot to say about that. Um, you know, I, I have read phenols in um, extra virgin olive oil can prevent blood clots. Interestingly, though, in my um, research, I did come across that um, extra virgin olive oil absorbs calcium, really draws it into the body. So that's something to consider. Also, while it may facilitate, you know, um, blood thinning properties, you once again, you want to you want to institute a good K2 vitamin with that. Um, extra virgin olive oil is also very high in vitamin E. Let's see. Um, I have beetroot powder. That one is a popular one. That one we've talked about. Yeah, the beetroot about powder is really interesting because I heard that that really helps with HDLs. And the only thing that struck me is when I saw your comment also in our, our group and the discussion about it is that I didn't realize, and especially for someone, you know, I, I want to have kids at some point. I'm always very conscious about the metals that I put in my body. And you mentioned that because it's a root that it has is very high in metals. And while it might be good for my dad and I try to put it in his smoothies that maybe I shouldn't be consuming as much of it. So, yeah, so this actually, so we could talk all day and all night. So this goes back. So this could go back to the genetic portion of it where you, when you do the genetic screening, you can identify whether you're a poor metabolizer of these heavy metals and things that really makes a difference. People with like a fast comp and there, there's quite a few other genes involved, but those people, they clear estrogens almost too quickly. They clear heavy metals very quickly. So, so that's why when people take stuff, so one person will be like, well, that worked fine for me. Other people are like, Oh, that didn't work for me because, you know, on a genetic level, it's really how it's, how it's working for us. Um, so with heavy metal toxicity, I, I, it wasn't on my radar before, um, until I became an intragenomic counselor. I'll tell you what, I mean, the damage that that can do and the amount of time it takes to clear heavy metals is astounding. I, so not to go off topic, but on topic, with heavy metal poisoning was my, my first encounter was, uh, I received a copper paragard IUD after my pregnancy. First, I didn't notice within about six months, I started feeling like a humming in my body, a buzzing feeling. It was really strange. And I kept telling my doctor and he's like, no, it couldn't be, you know, whatever. I asked to be checked for, um, my copper levels because it is a copper IUD. He said, no, you don't have Wilson's disease. Don't worry about it. You know, um, about a year to the day after I had it put in, I had it removed and they checked my, uh, my copper levels. My zinc levels were tanked, which is antagonistic with copper, but my copper levels were through the roof. It took me two years to clear that copper out of my body. Oh my goodness. Um, where I didn't feel like I was humming. I didn't feel like I had, was having panic attacks, uh, constantly. My hair was falling out in chunks. Um, I can't, I can't stress enough. Um, I thought the right thing to do would be to purchase an HTMA test, which is a, a hair toxin mineral analysis. Um, it, it's a good, it's a good, it's, it's a good overview of things, but it doesn't, um, the better testing is still like for copper poisoning would be ceruloplasmin testing with a copper serum, you know, um, but anyway, so, so the whole spiel is this, yeah, um, heavy metals, man, they are, they are rough. And when, when you get sick with them, it's hard to, you may have to go through chelation, um, procedures mm -hmm. where they have to actually like run your blood through this thing and remove all the heavy metals. It's crazy. So to, to avoid as many heavy metals as you can is, is really important. Um, I mean, beetroot powder. Yeah. It's, it's going to have heavy metals. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, root vegetable, but as long as you're not, you know, taking it every day, all day long, max doses, you know, um, you should be fine. You know, everything in moderation. Okay. Um, we do have quite a few questions. Can we jump to those? Then we'll get back to some of the other. I want to let, um, I know Douglas has some, and I know Rebecca just jumped in and, um, Nancy, um, Douglas, do you want to jump in with a question and then we'll get to, Nancy and Rebecca. Go ahead, uh, Rebecca. 
Okay, I just, uh, I was curious about the the resveratrol or however, I don't know if I'm saying that right. but Reservatrol, uh-huh. Reservatrol, um, when, if you have hypothyroid and everything, you had said like to steer clear, is that even if you're taking thyroid medication and you're well controlled, is it still a no? I, I would, I would say don't. It, okay. it, it's going to make your medication less effective. That makes you sense. may, you know what? It could be that, you know, you could take it, but your doctor will have to exponentially raise your dose, which you don't want either. So, you know, there's, I going through, and I, I don't know if I'll be able to cover everything, but I do have a lot of great alternatives. So you okay. don't have to focus on Reservatrol um, as being an only option. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there are options for you. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, Nancy, what's your question? Um, I was, I'm a diabetic, been a diabetic for over 20 years. And I'm just wondering about berberine because that's what I keep hearing about. I will have to tell you for years, yeah. many, many, I've taken a lot of supplements. I feel pretty good. I do a lot of research on them, but now I'm adding more. And when you're buying medications and then trying to buy supplements, it gets expensive. So right. I'd love to get my list down, but now today I'm adding more. So, but I'm wondering about the berberine, what you know about that. Yeah, yeah. So berberine, I mean, they call it nature's ozempic. Um, berberine, it's touted for potentially having weight loss abilities by, by you know, um, reducing appetite. Um, it can reduce blood sugar, cholesterol. I thought I had it somewhere in here in my notes, but maybe I, I missed it. Um, I will tell you as far as... Um, berberine goes and this is not the norm but it is an ammonia it's a quaternary ammonia genic compound which means it's it's ammonia based people who have trouble with metabolizing ammonia whether it's a urea cycle disorder or or anything else may have trouble taking it um i know i do because i have that but that is not the norm so i don't want to really put that out there as like the common info but something to watch for for sure um, I think berberine would be, I mean, I can't tell you to take it. I don't know, you know, your background and everything, but, but I know that it, it, you know, it's a, it, it is a good, um, alternative to, um, diabetic medications if you can with weight loss and, and diet and everything. So it could I'm be kidding. something to transition to, if you made those steps. I heard at one point that there was a test and I forget it was called, and that was another $150 plus test, but if you were someone who was diabetic, it would actually tell you whether or not vitamin E would help you or hurt you. And if you, if you know, what I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. So I this what it's just called. got dumped in my lap and it may not be what you're talking about, but this is just an, another genetic haptoglobin, issue. So haptoglobin. It's I the haptoglobin know. test. So you get your ha a haptoglobin test. And if you get this haptoglobin test and you're diabetic, it'll tell you whether or not you have a certain gene mutation that it will really help your diabetes to take vitamin E or it'll really hurt you if you're eating a lot of foods with vitamin E or taking vitamin E. I'm, uh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. What have you oh, learned? You, you've, oh, you've heard me. something. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So this just got dumped in my lap um, just the other day. So, so this hails um, from the GSTP1 gene, which is glutathione S transferase uh, pi one, bunch of mumbo, you know, big names. So know, anyway, a, a nutrition geek and genetics geek that you just, it rolls off the tip of your tongue. <laughs> I mean, it really does. It's just like, you know, and it's so oh yeah, so yeah. That's just gonna blow up. That means, um, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I I just laughed with my husband the other day. I said, "Who came up with all these names?" So, um, so the GSTP1 gene um, variant uh, affects uh, glutath glutathione synthase. So glutathione is the master antioxidant in the body. Glutathione is super important. Um, and if you're low, increased oxidative stress, cancers, all sorts of stuff. Um, 
anyway, funny enough, uh, the GSTP1 gene does affect um, vitamin E supplementation. And it really depends on whether you have a heterozygous or homozygous status, whether you can um, tolerate vitamin E supplements. I just found that out, actually. And um, I was taking about 200 IUs of vitamin E a day. I found that was too much. They, they suggest 75 IUs, which is a very low dose. That's for like children. Um, if people have this uh, uh, gene, if they have a heterozygous version of it. Very cool. Can I ask one more question? Of course, of course. Okay. How do we, you know, there's so many supplements on the market and I try to research mine, go with really good companies. How do we, can you give us any tips on how we can find these good companies? I don't want to take supplements that aren't doing anything for me. That right. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, um, great question. Yeah. Um, third party testing. I don't mean to, you know, be so generic third party testing is huge, huge. And even then, like, um, I, they really got to have the, the background to back it up because like, so there's some reputable brands such as now, have you heard of the now brand? It's not, it's, it's a very generic brand. It's all caps N O W while they're considered third party tested in a family owned, um, vitamin company i just read an article from 2021 where they failed like um 12 different uh uh batch tests for curcumin and turmeric so so yeah you just really want to do your research i could i could recommend so so there's a couple really reputable brands that i work with one is called thorn t-h-o-r-n-e Okay. Very reputable brand. Uh, I will tell you a little pricier, but, but intermediately priced on my scale. So I'll tell you that one's intermediate. Um, another one would be called Seeking Health. Um, that, seeking. Seeking. S-E-E-K-I-N-G. Okay. Health. That's mm -hmm. by Dr. Ben Lynch. Dr. Ben Lynch is also a nutrigenomics counselor. Um, he's, he's got so much more behind him than I do. But um, really, really big supplements. Um, another one would be pure encapsulations. Now that one will be, I would rate that very pricey. You know, you're going to pay 75 to hundred dollars for, depending on what, what you're purchasing. The quality is there though. And they're actually one of the ones I would have recommended for uh, curcumin, which is a derivative of a, a turmeric powder. All right. So, um, let me think Jaro Jaro is another one. Love them. J A R R O W. Very okay. affordable. Very okay. affordable. Um, I mean, I use called now I use new chapter. I also, my reserve is from Luma nutrition. So I don't know. I, yeah, but I will look, you know, can you think of any others? I mean, I'm going to research them all. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, those are the primary ones I work with. Um, I do like, so I sometimes use now it depends. Um, sometimes I I'll deal with NutraCost. That's N U T R I C O S T. I'm going to tell you though about NutraCost and now actually I'm going to add nature made in there, which you would think is a high quality supplement. No, you got to be yeah. careful with nature made now and NutraCost because they will use, sometimes they will use like soybean oils and uh, sunflower oils and all of these PUFAs, uh, polyunsaturated fats uh, oxidize very easily. They're not good. You know, a lot of omega-6 fatty acids. So I look at the quality of the ingredients they're utilizing. Um, sometimes I have found uh, now to use extra virgin olive oil as an ingredient, which is wonderful. So you really just want to look at, um, yeah, the, the the other ingredients in it. You know, you don't yeah. want a lot of that uh, bad oil. Well, I have, I have my homework for me, so I'll be doing some research. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Those are some great brands to start with. I try to take a good multivitamin to get as much as I can in one pill too. So, um, but I'll, I'll I'm be not a fan of the multis, although it depends. They have a time and a place. You'll find Seeking Health has wonderful multivitamins. Dr. Ben Lynch, again, uh, he is an MTHFR expert, um, geneticist. He, um, 
uh, he formulates all of his multivitamins. He has methyl free versions. He has methylated versions. He has histamine X, uh, which is a, a supplement for histamine and the Dow gene. He's got it all. Go to Seeking Health. You will not be disappointed. Going back to the berberine discussion, um, so I, I have my um, my mentor and my friend listening in. She wanted to add um, that diabetics, uh, if you're taking metformin, you should not take berberine with metformin. Thank Just you. Gave me some money. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I typically will break it down for them and say, okay, well, we're going to have to do everything separate. What you first do is you, you do baseline vitamin le level testing before you even start the vitamins, test your levels. You need um, your levels tested. Then you can start your, your um, regimen three months afterwards. You would retest to see if there's any improvement, but, um, mm. but yeah, I typically for the first three months suggest people take everything separately in their multivitamin. And I know that sounds crazy, but I could boil it down to about a hundred dollars, 125, um, for everything that you would find in the multivitamin that I could purchase separately. Um, and I'm looking at, I think someone just shared, and I think that might've been Nancy. I can't see um, all of her vitamins. And I feel terrible because we talked about Centrum that it just does not absorb in most. I mean, I, I've seen studies that it just does not absorb in the body. It, it's been kind of a, I mean, I was told it was a waste of money. Um, when you get the super B complexes and the B vitamins and such, you do need to make sure that they're bioavailable and, and methylated. Is that what I think that's what not Stephanie necessarily says. they don't need um, to be. Well, no, no. So, so, so methylated is the preferred form. That is absolutely the preferred form, but yeah. going back to, and I know it's so much to pack into a small amount of time, but the comp mutation, huge determinate uh, determinant of whether um, you can take methylated vitamins uh, efficiently. Um, if you take them and you have a slow comp, um, you would develop things such as joint pain, um, uh, brain fog, um, anxiety is a big one, um, insomnia. So um, methylated vitamins are definitely not for everybody, although they're <laughs> ideally what everybody should take. Yeah. Steph, Hi, I, put, I put the list of vitamins that I take every day that were prescribed four years ago by my general practitioner. They're in the okay. chat. Right. That's what we just, um, we were talking about. I, I was talking about I don't yours. Think this... She actually saw them though. If you click I... on them, they'll go full screen. Yes. The Centrum's 50. I'm concerned about actually doing anything. So, you know, I so. Yeah, I've looked them over. So, so as far as I, I'm not necessarily familiar. Let me see here. Let, let's look. So you get the B12. So, wow. All oh, right. Yeah. Um, you're, you're okay. So you have a methylfolate supplement here, but you yes, also have, I have been tested over and over for vitamin deficiencies. I have vitamin D, B, yes. or folate. Gotcha. Sounds um, like she has the MTHFR. Does she? I don't know. She probably hasn't been tested oh, for that, I would no. imagine, but you don't think so? So, so how do you feel when you take the methylfolate? I've been taking it for years, no problem. No problem. And I okay. also am very low in vitamin D. So when, mm. when my when my pains first came on in my legs and feet four years ago, this is what they thought. Only one time did they actually give me a vitamin B injection in the office. But this is what, what they've recommended. I've taken it ever since with no problem. Prescription yeah. drugs, oh my God. I have had reaction after reaction after reaction. I won't yeah. take anything prescription anymore. So, so... <laughs> One, one, one thing that you probably want to do, especially if you're, you're considering, or you think that, you know, you're, you're B deficient or that, you know, would be to do the homocysteine test. Uh, it's super easy. Your, your um, primary care provider can order it. And it really, it gives so much insight into how you're methylating and whether that folate's really making it to where it needs to go. The problem with excess folate in the blood is it increases homocysteine levels. 
Um, and that increases the risk of cardiovascular events, um, adverse events happening. So, yeah. so that's something to really identify. Um, you know, I can't see the doses on your complex, so I wouldn't know. Um, your mag oxide is actually a lower bio, it's, it's a lower absorption magnesium. So I actually don't typically, I wouldn't recommend that. If, if you want a wonderful magnesium supplement, try, it's called Citramate, C-I-T-R-A-M-A-T-E by Thorne, T-H-O-R-N-E. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a uh, magnesium citrate malate combo. Oh, it's wonderful. Um, that one is very neutral. I, I'm able to recommend that to everybody. The other one would be either magnesium glycinate or like an L3 innate. But if I were you, I would just try that um, citramate. That's a wonderful magnesium to try. Should I just, I just wonder what the others? Um, with your D3, you want to add a K2. Um, I would say two K seven. If if you don't have the histamine issues, if you have histamine, it'd be K four. But um, you definitely, especially being part, of, you know, having the peripheral artery disease, you you want the K two. That's going to facilitate I'm, the calcium removal from your arteries to the bones. Um, there's been saying, studies done. They're oh. saying it's not. They're not saying what are they saying? Oh, it's not neuropathy now. The doctor has called it PAD. You're right. I'm sorry. It's yeah. okay. But, you know, interestingly, though, if you do suffer from any neuropathy, a really great B vitamin for neuropathy is called benfodi uh, benfodiamine. It's bioavailable B1. And um, it's typically taken like 300 to 600 milligrams a day. I take it. It cured the neuropathy or at least it's, it stopped the neuropathy in my toes that I was developing where it was like a pinching pain. Um, they they uh, doctors um, use it regularly for people. Also, I believe diabetes. You may want to check, though. Um, but for the for the B, I know that, you know, something that really again, help me is really making sure and, and stuff. I, and there are some that have the, the folate in them. So you can get a super complex methylated liposomal B vitamin that goes underneath your tongue. That's also methylated folate. So, well so with to, folate. To make, yeah, methyls. So you hear methylated vitamins and your brain yeah. thinks methylated vitamins. There's only two methylated vitamins. B9 and B12, known as methylcobalamin and methylfolate. So if you can't have methylfolate or methylcobalamin, then just throw that out there because there's no there's no other methylated vitamins. But I'm I'm taking methyl um, methylfolate. Mm -hmm. I I would be careful because you also must have um, a, a form of folate in the super B complex. I would be curious to see how much is in that um, yeah. because again, like I said, too much folate with without cofactors, you can raise your homocysteine. Yeah. And that's, you know, when you're talking about, you know, plaque that's going all the way down and hundred percent blockage is going down your legs. There's something damaging the arteries with that much calcium. And so it, it might be an issue to get under control. If you can get to a functional medicine dietitian, someone who can get those blood tests urgently and get you on the right, you know, medic, right supplements as is what happened with, you know, my dad and even, even myself, my LDL particle number was so high. They're like, what is going on here? And they realized that as soon as, um, I was able to get on the liposomal methylated B vitamins with folate that I, I mean, my homocysteine yeah. levels dropped and my LDL, small LDL particle numbers really dropped significantly over the course of time. So something to take seriously and check into. And I so had one, I was going to say, so, um, oh, it's stuff you, you got to it. Um, the hair yeah, testing that's a wonderful question. versus blood testing. That's a really good question. So that's, Thank that's you, where I was going with that, with that, um, metal toxicity I was talking about earlier is I thought to do an HTMA test, but that's an overview of the big picture. Like if you want to take a piece of that pie, that would be the blood testing. And that tells you what's happening right now. HTMA is a big picture of like the last three months to nine months, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, depending. So, yeah. 
Um, and also, um, um, fish oil, omega threes. Uh, some people can't take a general like fish oil and are concerned because of the thinning of the blood. And they're already on aspirin, blood thinner. Their arms are just completely tattooed with um, with their their blood at the surface. There, um, I was told with the fish oil. I was getting it off the shelf. Then I was getting it from general Amazon, whatever's the least expensive. I was told that most fish oil on a store shelf is rancid, has absolutely no impact whatsoever, could even be um, Oxida doing damage. Oxidative. With the, with it, it also has, um, uh, as much as has omega-3s, it also has omega-6. And that's um, uh, PUFA, polyuns polyunsaturated fatty acids. Those are the ones that oxidize very easily that cause oxidative stress in the body. Um, uh, seed oils, you know, that kind of thing um, are in the same line with like the omega sixes, omega six are the bad oils. <laughs> so which do you, so when it comes to fish oil, like I'm supposed to take it supposedly because I have a precursor to macular degeneration. So they told me I need a lot of omegas. Um, what would you, I ended up with getting this one in a bag and it's from a reputable company. They, they're very fresh. They make them all the time. They don't let things sit on store shelves. So even though it's through Amazon, it, it's not Amazon filled. It has to go through mm -hmm. the actual little small manufacturer. What is your suggestion there for people, um, with omega threes? They, you know, there's so many options. You even see the commercial on TV for krill oil. Is krill oil really better than a general fish oil or? Yeah. You so it? you're not going to like my answer, which is dealing with my cardiologist. And I've actually had two opinions for, and, and, and Hey, third time's the charm. So maybe someone else has, can, has some input, but, um, uh, I, two cardiologists tell me that that's old news. Um, fish oil has not really been proven to help ha the heart any more than you would think. And that it's really just kind of a waste of money. I wanted, I didn't want to believe it. I'm like, no way. You know, you think fish heart health, you know, you know, and, um, I looked up, I looked it up. I found so many articles about it that sure enough, there is not it. I mean, if it did make any, you know, contribution, it was so nominal, it wasn't worth mentioning. So, I mean, unless you can find other studies, I, I personally stopped taking it and I don't want to tell anybody else to do that unless, you know, that was me, but I, I don't use fish oil. Yeah, and I don't so, do it for heart health. I was doing it more that they said that it would help with the I, macular degeneration. Yeah. Yeah. That's one. Um, I'm just a patient on, I don't deal with it with nutrigenomics. So I, I don't know, but I, yeah. I stopped taking it. It is a PUFA too. And, um, polyans, uh, PUFAs increase, um, oxidization estrogen. Um, and I already deal with estrogen dominance and I notice when I take fish oil, um, my breasts ache. So, so there definitely is some, you know, there's something happening. So it just, it isn't for me. It's not something I recommend, but not to say that, you know, I'm just not an expert there. <laughs> um, let's go into the H. Go ahead. Sorry. Let's go into the H. pylori. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about that. And I know one of our admins so is really interested I, in that I as well. actually am excited about this one because that this is one that when you put it on the list, I thought, I don't know anything about that. You know, that's not nearly my cup of tea. But I will tell you, in the last year and a half, it actually is. I've worked with quite a few people. Um, I who have H. pylori or SIBO. Um, so this is, so the reference for H. pylori eradication is um, a bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, and florister combo. What that means, those are three different forms of a probiotic, technically two, because florister is a yeast. It's not a probiotic, but they call it one. Um, so Anyway, what this means is, so there's Florister. Florister is a patented version of Saccharomyces boulardii. Saccharomyces boulardii is a really specific type of yeast that um, is complementary to a probiotic. So you would take Florister with a probiotic. And um, it uh, basically what it does is it, it takes up room in your intestines. So it basically pushes out all the bacteria. There's no room left for the bacteria to grow. Um, so 
the big thing with Forrester is Forrester is that um, it's one of a kind. Um, you'll see Saccharomyces boulardii um, available on Amazon, wherever. If it doesn't say, if it's not the brand Floristor, it's Brewer's Yeast. It is literally beer yeast. <laughs> so um, they have a special form. Forrester has a patented form called CNCM-1745. And um, so that's what you would look for. So that's one component. Then you need bifidobacterium and lactobacillus combo. Um, there's so many strains of each of those. There's lactobacillus rhamnosus. That's a, an important one. I did the research for you guys. And the combo that I found that was really wonderful is Florister. And it's Renew Life Women's Probiotic 25 Billion CFUs, which is really important. Um, it has 12 strains. And you would take that with the Floristor, and that really helps to eradicate H. pylori. Um, in addition, if you're having uh, like gastric distress, where you're having like a lot of um, acid reflux, or your your stomach's burning, or if you just yeah you have stomach burning issues, um, a, a fantastic trick is uh, marshmallow root. Now this one I can't hail enough as being a godsend. What? Um, have you heard of marshmallow root? No. Uh -huh. So you can buy it's, a, it's it's in capsules. You can also prepare it as a tea. Let me tell you what. So I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm going to jump around a little bit. But so PPIs, you know, proton pump inhib inhibitors are what they give people for like acid reflux, indigestion, all of that. PPIs are so destructive to the to the stomach biome. And also um, it, it depletes you of B vitamins. It's like B vitamin. It depletes you of uh, vitamin C, calcium, magnesium and folate big time and B12. So me having MTHFR, me treating others, I thought, well, how, you know, you really got to look into these medications people are taking and how are they? Another one's metformin and methotrexate also, those really deplete folate in people. So anyway, um, the PPIs, I thought, well, what do I do? Because, you know, I, I have a lot of clients who have stomach issues. Marshmallow root I use personally and I was recommended for actually bladder pain, which I have from my venous compressions, long story. But so anyway, when you take it and I can't stress this enough and like I never used to be able to take aspirin. Aspirin would give me really bad heartburn. I can take a marshmallow root capsule and within 45 minutes, you literally feel the whole inside of your body feel like a coat. It's like it coats it in a, a marshmallow mucilage. It's so natural. It's very effective. Um, I don't even need the full dose. And it immediate. I mean, PPIs take days to build up in a person's system where you won't notice the effects immediately. But marshmallow root works instantly. That's another one. And I looked into it. It definitely supports H. pylori eradic um, eradication. Um, let's see here. Uh, it coats the entire digestive tract, urinary tract, and protects the lining from irritation and bacteria while healing during H. pylori. So it works and it works instantly. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. Um, I buy my brand on Amazon. Uh, it's called nature's way. It's like seven bucks. And let me tell you, I have probably 12 bottles here. Like I'm afraid I'll run out. <laughs> so I like it stockpile it. What is it? It's um, it, it's it's um, well, it's marshmallow root. <laughs> it's the best, like, not like the marshmallow we would put on a s'more, right? <laughs> no, no, it's oh, a yeah. flower. Okay. It's a flowering, oh. yeah. But um, you know, I don't think it's the same thing. Marshmallow root and marshmallow. I would actually, I'm over here googling it myself. I'm not really yeah, sure on that. I thought marshmallows were like a man-made concoction, although like sugar and you know i don't know what a marshmallow yeah, is. yeah so marshmallow candy is different it does not contain the herb marshmallow root so <laughs> they, they are different but when but i think maybe marshmallow root was named that for the i don't know the fluffiness of it but it definitely you can feel it like create a mucilage throughout your digestive tract it's so crazy so i really i really push that one that one's wonderful and it'll get you off of ppis completely like you won't need antacids if you take this and there's there's no downside to it. It doesn't, it doesn't interact with, Oh, I take it back. The only interaction marshmallow root has is with lithium. 
it causes um, reduced excretion rate of lithium. So you have to be careful, be careful if you take a lithium um, medication. Who would take a lithium medication? How would you even know? Oh, that's prescribed by a doctor. Um, so lithium is a mood, a mood control um, medication. And uh, I mean, that one's prescribed by a doctor. Then there's uh, lithium orotate, which is actually a supplement you can get um, over the counter. It's like the more natural form of a uh, weaker form of lithium. But I, the patient would know if they were on lithium, I would assume. Let's see here. And then one thing I wanted to talk about Stephanie, was. Um, can I ask you something? Yes, go what, for it. What, uh, what What is the dosage for that marshmallow root? Oh, good question. Um, and actually, you know, let me grab here. Let me grab it quick. Okay. So it's 960 milligrams per serving. I don't know if you can see this bottle. Mm -hmm. This is what it looks like. And if you find it on Amazon, it has five star reviews. This is just like it sells out. I have so many bottles here. I will never run out. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Is that um, once a day or? Uh... Oh, as. Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, it says take two capsules as needed. I only end up needing one. And I'll tell you, I don't even need it later in the afternoon. Now, if I went really crazy and I had a bunch of aspirin and then I went and ate some tacos and, you know, I'm asking for it, I might need to take it twice in a day. But I, I'm telling you, I'm so surprised at how quickly it works. It's, it's really amazing stuff. Well, it doesn't matter if you take it with or without food. No, it doesn't. It doesn't matter for me. No. Okay. Um, I would say though, because it coats your, your stomach in a mucilage, um, what I do do is I take my medications, like my prescription medications prior if I can, because what it does do is like I said, like with the lithium, it can kind of slow down the, um, Correct. you know, metabolic, you know, cause it's, it's coating the inside of your, so, so that medicine's not being absorbed. So that's the only thing to really consider, but, um, it's, so it's that would be really good for uh, nighttime then. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, I'm telling you. And you want to know something really crazy. So I was diagnosed previously with Barrett's esophagus. And I'm not sure if you guys know what that is, but it's precancer of the throat. I am not only in complete remission, there's no, they ha there's nothing to even say that I have it anymore. And I want, I really want to contribute that to the marshmallow root I've been using for the last couple of years. Absolutely. Because I have GERD, and I was wondering oh. if that would help heal, you know, yes. what's going on with me. Yes, yes. Go buy a bottle, like, right now. You will thank me. I'm not kidding. And you'll throw out all of the Z Zantac and Prilosec. You'll throw it all out. It's garbage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I wonder. One of, one of the things, and for people, and I'm curious on, on this call, Douglas and, you know, all of you guys, but... Um, my dad, when he was put on both the antiplatelet and anticoagulant, ther anticoagulant therapies, he was told to take a um, an antacid that is um, it starts with a P, and was told to take it because of the pantoprazole? fear. What? Pantoprazole. That's it. And at first, we we didn't want to take it. We weren't going to take it. And because I don't like the side effects um, of it and it becomes, they claim you can get off of it, but I just don't feel like you can. And because your system's never the same. And I'm wondering if they're concerned about him developing an ulcer and getting bleeding. And so I'm wondering if um, it sounds like the marshmallow root would do the same thing except without the side effects that correct this so has. yeah so so when you have um in, so so when you take those ppis they basically just shut down the production of stomach acid and stuff you know going on in your in your stomach and and in the meantime they also block the absorption of the b vitamins and stuff if you were to take yeah, I, that's what i'm concerned about with my dad yeah so this is where i this is why it's my bag of tea with nutrigenomics is 
Um, it definitely impacts vitamin B absorption. Um, and, and long-term, they're just bad for you. You can really look, ca the cancer risk goes up. There's so much, I'm telling you like this marshmallow root and I can't, I really, this is one I will stand by, I will stand on is that um, I was able to completely I don't even think about Zantac. I don't even carry any of those things anymore. You know, I don't, I don't need Tums. Um, I'm very confident in that. And also I've, I've developed um, in the past, um, like I've had uh, ulcers and stuff. And um, that definitely that coats the ulcer and you don't feel that pain anymore and it helps it heal. Absolutely. Sounds good. Yeah. Anyone else have any more any more questions for Steph? She's been here a while. Um, I was trying to go back through and I keep, you know, getting interrupted because I'm so interested in what you're saying, Steph, but I, I know that Douglas was posting a lot of questions and he said that everything's kind of been answered, but I just want to make sure that I'm going through and making sure everybody's questions, including his, are answered. Um, it's been so amazing. Can you guide us um, before we go in? We appreciate your time. And your commitment to it staying in our group, even though you found out you don't have pad, um, we appreciate your support. Um, we appreciate you, you know, uh, agreeing. I don't remember if I sent you the uh, advisory agreement yet, um, but I don't if I so, didn't, but... I didn't send it. Okay. Um, but would love, you know, for people to be able to tag you within reason, but would love for you to guide us on the types of things that you feel comfortable talking about um, in answering and when they can tag you in the group and, and with what questions. Yeah, absolutely. No, for sure. Um, this is something I'm really passionate about. Like I said, with uh, the, and with nutrigenomics and stuff that really crosses paths with the cardiovascular, I mean, big time with the cardiovascular aspect. So I'm happy, you know, to stay in the group and, um, you know, uh, answer any questions anybody has for sure. Yeah. And if, if anything, what I've loved is that you're so quick to research them too, um, because you can make sense of some of the stuff out there and you can weed through some of the BS um, that we all read out there. Here's one quick one that um, is, is interesting that you I don't know if you ha are familiar with, but uh, we have one of our doctors that came on, Dr. James Antizana, who's in our group, and he is really big mm -hmm. on Ceylon cinnamon. And there have been studies that have been done that talk about Ceylon cinnamon, uh, being able to lower the A1C having an impact there, but also secondarily, but not as much proven that they're willing to step out and say it really helps, but, um, also with cholesterol and you need to do two or three weeks on, but then two weeks off. And you need to make sure you, you time this because it can build up in the liver. So it needs time to, you know, um, to get out, but I've, that's something that we're all fascinated. And I know Marsha and I, 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 I just started taking Ceylon cinnamon, um, as well on a daily basis. Yeah. So I, um, that's, I, I've heard it just like you guys, you know, I've seen it around. Um, it's not something I use. It's not something I deal with at all. Um, from a genetic standpoint, um, the one that I wanted to just talk about real quick before we go that I mentioned before was, um, the turmeric curcumin, um, yeah. that one, that one is a, that one's really great, but you've got to be really careful. Um, you're better off purchasing it as a 95% curcumin with, um, black pepper and the black pepper has its own patent called bio pepperine. Um, but curcumin would be the bio uh, that's the active ingredient in the turmeric. The reason you don't want to buy turmeric, and I'm like, really want to stress this to people. Um, turmeric is also a root. Um, it's been found. And this is actually, this was the one that, that failed for the now brand testing was um, it's notoriously high in lead and cadmium. And like, even, even places that have third party testing have, like I said, failed um, with turmeric. So I just avoid turmeric. The brand, I can't stress enough that I found it was a wonderful brand for curcumin. What I'm talking about is uh, Pure Encapsulations, a uh, wonderful brand. And they have 95% curcumin with the biopepperine. And um, so that that I'm more familiar with than the Ceylon. But I, I think they kind of act the same. Okay, um, so I use Me First Living turmeric curcumin with biopepperine. 1,000 milligrams, 95% yeah. curcumin. 
there you go. There you go. <laughs> you're, you, hey, you're ahead of the curve. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, so that's what you wanna, one out of a dozen. There you can go. One, so yeah, that's that's can, what you want to look for. And 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 ditch the turmeric um in general. Like you you want the what you have. So um, I'm excited. I have one right. Yeah. Can I talk about one last thing? I just wanted to say that happened to me that I think is kind of really important to tell you guys, especially with the PAD. So I started taking Colest off like last year. Um, I'm going through perimenopause and I have a hypothyroid. When you have hypothyroid, your cholesterol will be totally crazy. And so my cholesterol shot up like overnight. Um, I started taking Colest off, started taking all these plant sterols. And I thought, oh, this is going to be good. You know, I, I'm going to go back in a couple months, check it, and it'll be half. My cholesterol doubled in oh, like no. not even six months. And we were like, why? What's going on? I have, well, it's called a FADS1 and FADS2 mutation, um, which is a genetic thing um, that makes it very difficult to break down um, seed oils and things like linoleic acid, which peanut oil is really high in, um, meat, eggs, veggie oils, coffee. Well, anyway, what what that's called when you develop atherosclerosis or you develop high cholesterol from plant sterols is called cytosterolemia. This has not gotten enough recognition, but it's something I also have. Um, so I'm now going through genetic testing to confirm it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's something where you can't, the plant sterols work against you. They clog your arteries. Um, they do have a process for treating it, which involves a medicine. It starts with an E. It's like a Zetim, Timbe or something, but I haven't made it that far yet. But I did, I did um, cease taking the, the plant sterols in favor of pantothene, which pantothene won't act the same way. That's not a sterol. So, <laughs> but, but something to be, to watch for, especially if you're starting uh, plant sterol um, supplementation. Yeah, see, I mean, you're just driving home the facts that, I mean, it, what we've been talking about, and it's so challenging that it's it's really hard to tell. Genetics plays such an important role, and there's still so, so much that we all need to learn. But if something doesn't feel right and the doctor says, you, you know, you should be taking this supplement or that medication, or there are even, um, you know, for example, with um, Plavix, in some people, Plavix really does not work. And you need to get a saliva test to actually, there is a genetic test that they do to make sure. And I, I tell people, well, before you do, if you don't think the Plavix is working, there's something going on, you're having repeat procedures and things are happening, ask them to get it tested. Everyone we've done that on, we've had literally more than a dozen people in our group who have been on Plavix and it just did not work for them. And it wasn't until we got involved and we said, hey, ask your doctor for the genetic test to see if your body is processing it properly. And in fact, they weren't there. They're, it's really important to do the research. And you know what, if you can't do the genetic testing, well, there are so many other options out there. Um, even when she was saying, Steph was saying with the Reservatrol, if you can't take that, she has a million other things. And it might be something, Steph, if you wanted to post in the group that these are some you know, other options to Reservatrol if you have um, the hyperthyroidism, um, that that can also provide some of the same benefits, but to always ask your doctor, um, yeah. you know, that might be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I can, I can, uh, I have an outline of all everything we've talked about, and that's something I can uh, submit to the group um, after I go through it. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Kim, um, the the test you just, I, I forget what it's called, but you can ask them for a genetic test to see if the Plavix is working for you, if, or if you have, I think it's an a, a absorption issue or the way your body processes or something. Um, there are also issues on between Plavix and certain statins and Dr. Anita Dua from Mass General, a vascular surgeon here did in a very early small study on um, how uh, there is, there are, I think, particular statins and Plavix that utilize the same vehicle inside the body. So the Plavix can't get on the bus if the statin's on the bus and vice versa. Somehow 
however that works. And with I would the, imagine that's the same with, with other supplements and medications as well. With the uh, CYP pathways I discussed, um, those liver with pathways liver, that right. metabolize everything, the test that um, people can get clinically that I'm not a big fan of because it doesn't give you that raw data, but it does give you valuable information. It's called gene site testing. That is actually a psychopharmacogenic test for like psychiatrists will give it to people um, who have depression or anxiety because of methylation oh. issues. So what they do, they only oh. test two things, MTHFR and COMPT. They test those two. Um, then they test all the CYP pathways. What they then do, and I don't have it with, with me, but I could show you another time. It's a whole report. They will literally take all the psychopharmacogenic medications and, and list how you metabolize them. They show your pathways. How are you an ultra rapid metabolizer, slow metabolizer, regular metabolizer? This does not just, um, this is not just relate to psychopharmacogenic drugs, it, all medication. CYP mm -hmm. pathways metabolize everything from, from hormones, medication, toxins, all of that. So, so gene site testing is actually, I mean, if someone really needed something on the sly, I would say that. Um, and they, would you mind putting that in the group too? Would you mind doing a post on, on that? Yeah, I can do chest testing tested. options and everything for sure. Um, and, uh, uh, gene site has a promise that if your insurance does not cover it, they will never charge you more than $330 out of pocket. Um, Still a lot, my insurance, <laughs> which is a lot, but yeah. when I got the, when I got the bill of what my insurance did cover, it was like $6,000. So, <laughs> you know, me paying three okay. thirty in the, in the big picture things, but, but yeah, yeah, I'm absolutely happy to, um, that's why I wanted to talk and really connect was. They're really, you know, with genetic testing and stuff, um, now that we have that, we don't have to put the cart before the horse anymore. You can go and look and say, hey, you should not be having folic acid, which down the line is going to end up giving you cardio. You're going to have a stroke. You're going to have a heart attack. You're going to have blood clots. You know, you're able to be proactive in your own health, which is just so cool. So um, I can't, I'm not, I, I can't be excited enough about it. And um, I feel like it's really important for people with cardiovascular issues to, to know and know they have options. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. We appreciate you taking all this time on a Saturday and spending it with us. 